Welcome back friends to another session of fluid mechanics and rate processes. So, we have been talking about potential flows and we saw that these are very special flows where you have zero viscosity. So, it is an ideal fluid incompressible flow and then they are further irrotational. And we will see that they are uh, extremely important in modeling the flow because of the ease of analysis. So, today we are going to review uh, the flow equations a little bit and then we are going to look at some of the building blocks of this uh, potential flows and then superpose some of them to get actual flows which are very useful in modeling. So, let me just recollect for you what potential flows are. So, the assumptions that we made is that these are flows which are inviscid and for the purpose of this course we said they are irrotational. You can have potential flows for compressible flows also, but for the purpose of this course we are dealing with incompressible flows. and we are dealing with conservative body forces. For flows that satisfy these conditions, we term them as potential flows. So, let us look at each one of these uh, attributes a little bit more closely. Inviscid as I have said many times is essentially that you have frictionless flow so, the viscosity of the fluid is 0. This is absolutely hypothetical, there is no fluid which has 0 viscosity. Okay. So, this is really a idealized situation. Irrotational, we said a flow is irrotational if it has 0 vorticity everywhere. So, the curl of the velocity is identically 0 everywhere. So, this implies omega is 0 and omega of course, we have talked about as curl of the velocity field. Okay. This is also synonymous with the circulation being 0, which we have talked about in an earlier session. Incompressible, this condition is the material rate of change of density of a fluid particle is 0. So, this has been useful because we have been taking the simplified continuity equation, which is simply the divergence of velocity field is 0. Conservative body forces, these are forces which of course, uh, we can also express them as gradients of a certain potential and here we are only going to talk about gravity. So, that is a very special body force that we have chosen. If we make these assumptions, then what we have shown is that the velocity can be expressed as a gradient of a potential. So, this phi corresponds to the velocity potential and the governing equation for uh, such kind of flows is simply Laplacian of phi is 0 with of course, the relevant boundary conditions. We can also talk about stream function and we have done that in the last session. So, can also use psi which is the stream function. Stream function need not be defined for irrotational flows. For example, the velocity potential is defined only for irrotational flows. Stream function is more general it can be defined for all kinds of flows including rotational flows. But the problem with stream function is that in two dimensions it is a scalar, but when you go to three dimensions then you do not have a scalar anymore, you will have a vector function and therefore, the operation becomes a little bit more difficult. So, the governing equation for the flow with stream function is again of the same kind which is del square psi equal to 0. Just to remind you, we were able to derive this condition simply from the divergence of 
the velocity field to be 0 and the flow being irrotational. As far as this con condition is concerned, the stream function already satisfies the continuity equation. So, it is divergence free and we just have to impose a condition that it is an irrotational flow and we are able to get that. Okay, now, to move forward, I would like to uh, kind of share with you some information both in Cartesian and cylindrical coordinates. So, let us first go ahead with Cartesian coordinates. So, in the Cartesian coordinates, we are going to have x and y and v is expressed as v x i plus v y j. We will restrict ourselves to two dimensional potential flows because we want to use a scalar stream function. Okay? If we use a velocity potential only, then all these ideas would translate to three dimensions also, but for the purpose of simplicity, we will restrict to two dimensions. Okay, so, if this is the velocity, then it is possible to write V x as del phi del x, okay, simply from the gradient of phi and V y is simply del phi del y. In terms of the stream function, V x can also be written as del psi by del y and V y can be written as minus del psi by del x. Okay, so, you could write the velocity components simply by partial derivatives of the phi and psi. Okay. How about the Laplacian? The Laplacian of phi which would be exactly the same as the Laplacian of psi is simply given as del square phi by del x square plus del square phi by del y square in two dimensions. Of course, in the third dimension there would be another, another term del square phi by del z square, but I am not writing that because we have decided to stay in two dimensions. Great. So, we all know now how to uh, implement this in Cartesian coordinates. But as we will see uh, in the next few sessions that we would have to deal with flows where polar coordinates or cylindrical coordinates are more useful. So, let us do this for the cylindrical slash polar coordinates as well. So, here if this is my coordinate system x and y, then to define the polar components, I take a typical point here. Let us say the position vector of that point makes an angle theta with the x axis and this radial distance from the origin is r. To describe the velocities, I am going to talk about these two axes. So, this is a unit vector along the radial direction and this one over here is a radial vector along the theta direction. And as I go to a different point, so, so as I go to a different point and my theta changes, r can also change, these e r and e theta axes, they also kind of uh, rotate and I would have to define components along the radial and theta direction with respect to that point if I call this point as P. So, I am going to write my V, the velocity vector as simply V r times E r plus V theta times E theta. So, these are the polar coordinates. If you want to use the cylindrical coordinates, then there would be an additional term V z times the z and z axis is in the, uh, actually it is in the, uh, it is coming out of the 
plane of the blackboard. But again, as I said, we'll restrict to two dimensions. So far, so good. Now, how is the gradient defined? So, if you look at gradient of phi, which actually would be defined very similar to gradient of psi. So, in the polar coordinates, you would have del phi by del r e r and 1 by r del phi by del theta e theta. Okay. And if you had to define uh, v r now, so if you compare these two because v is gradient of phi, so you can see already that v r is going to be del phi by del r and v theta is going to be 1 by r del phi by del theta. Okay, so, given the velocity potential phi, I should be able to get the radial and the tangential components of speed. Alternately, I could get the Cartesian components of the speed as v x and v y if I, if I choose to use that coordinate system. How about the Laplacian? So, the Laplacian of phi is actually uh, 1 over r del by del r of r phi by del r sorry uh, this would be del by del r of r del phi by del r plus 1 by r square del square phi by del theta square. Okay. So, if I had to put del square phi equal to 0, then I would be putting these two terms equal to 0. Okay. So, that is your Laplacian in Cartesian in the cylindrical coordinates. So, once you are able to uh, do that, then of course, you can uh, write down the components and once you have the components, then you can use Bernoulli's equation to estimate the pressure. And how do you do that? We have said that for a flow which is incompressible, irrotational okay, uh, and steady. So, additionally if I talk about a steady flow, then the Bernoulli's equation says that my half of v square plus p by rho plus the terms g times h is constant everywhere. So, if I had a potential flow which by definition means that I have an irrotational flow, then the Bernoulli's equation can be applied between any two points in the flow. And then I could simply because I know the velocity and I know how the gravity acts, so I could estimate the pressure from this equation. Okay, so, the potential flows are extremely useful. Once I know uh, the potential, I can calculate the velocity and then use that to calculate pressure. How about the stream function? So, so let me just uh, talk about the stream function also. For the cylindrical and the polar coordinates, uh, of course, we already know <coughs> how it is defined in terms of the Cartesian coordinates. And for the cylindrical coordinates, I can say that V r is simply 1 by r del psi by del theta and v theta is actually given as minus del psi by del r. Okay, now that we have uh, reviewed the potential flows, we are going to use some building blocks now. Okay? So, the first flow that we want to do is a uniform flow. So, some simple flows and the first one is
a uniform flow. So the problem setup is something like this. I have this coordinate axis x and y and I have a, a flow where the streamlines are something like this. So they are aligned to the x axis at an angle theta and the speed of the flow is v infinity. Okay? So the problem is that we need to represent a flow which has a speed of v infinity and it is at an angle theta to the x axis. So I could write my velocity vector v as v infinity cosine theta i plus v infinity sine theta j. This is my vx and this here is my vy. Now I already know that vx is del phi del x and vy is del phi del y. If I integrate the first equation, then I would get that phi is given as v infinity cosine theta times x plus a function of y because this is a partial derivative with x. If I now take this function del phi del y, then this term is 0 and I get f prime y and this I already know should be equal to v y. So this is v infinity sin theta which actually implies that f y should be simply v infinity sin theta plus some constant c1. Sorry, there is a y here. Okay? And if I combine these two, so if I plug back f y in this, then these two functions imply that my phi is given as v infinity cosine theta x plus v infinity sin theta y plus of course a constant c1 and as you will notice that when I calculate the velocity field I only have to worry about the gradient of phi so this, the constant is not really so important. I can choose any value of constant, I can choose it to be 0 if I so desire. Okay, so that is my phi. How about my stream function? I can do the same thing. So my stream function, if you psi, then I know that Vx is del psi del y and del psi del x with a negative sign will give me Vy. I can use the same process to get my stream function and it would turn out to be v infinity cosine theta y minus v infinity sine theta x plus a constant c2. So that is my stream function and this here is my velocity potential. I can choose c1 and c2 equal to 0 without any change to the velocity field. Okay. Now I could ask myself what about the streamlines and the equipotential lines. So what are my streamlines? Streamlines are simply psi equal to constant. So maybe I can write that over here. So my streamlines are simply psi equal to constant. If I put psi equal to constant, then you know I am going to get simply this equation between x and y and you will see I would get back these lines that I have drawn. 
So these are different lines where this is psi equal to psi 1, this is psi equal to psi 2, psi equal to psi 3, psi equal to psi 4 and so on. If I want to plot equipotential lines, they are essentially phi equal to constant. So all I need to do is take this function and put this equal to a constant and by taking different values of that constant I would get these lines and you will find they will be orthogonal to these lines. So I can draw these lines. So this would be phi equal to phi 1, this would be phi equal to phi 2, phi equal to phi 3 and so on. It is also nice to remember that the streamlines they always have a direction and the direction is always as you know on every streamline the tangent to the streamline gives me the direction of the speed. Because this is a uniform flow so actually the streamlines are straight lines and they point in a direction which gives me the flow velocity. Okay. What can I say about the pressure? If I assume further that gravity is not important here, so gravity is suppose in the plane normal to the xy plane, then my Bernoulli's equation simply tells me that v square by 2 plus p by rho is constant if I neglect gravity. Because my v square is constant everywhere, it is a uniform flow, therefore my pressure is also constant everywhere. So I would get a constant atmospheric pressure everywhere in the uniform flow, there is no variation. Okay? So this is the most basic potential flow, a uniform flow at an angle to the axis.